Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is nurses strike. Why is it happening and what are the implications? So, as many of you have heard, there has been a strike by the Minnesota Nurses Association here in September of 2022. And it is the largest nursing strike in U.S. history. 15,000 nurses in the state of Minnesota have gone on strike, specifically in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth areas. Now, the Minnesota Nursing Association is the labor union for some of the nurses in Minnesota. And they are asking for a variety of things. Probably the two major things that they're asking for is better staffing ratios with their patients. So there's a certain number of patients that a nurse typically takes care of in the hospital. And so they're saying, okay, we want those ratios to be better. And they also want 30% more pay. They want a better pay. So they want better working conditions in terms of not having to take care of so many patients. And they want better pay. And that's consistent with what a lot of other demands by nurses have been in other strikes as well. The Minnesota nurses aren't the first nurses to go on strike. Nurses in other parts of America have gone on strike before for much of the same reasons. Now, let's specifically look at those two issues that there are demands. So one, in regards to their patient ratios, it's important to understand how patient ratios in a hospital work. So there's sort of three general levels of floors that where nurses take care of patients. There's sort of the general floor, which is referred to as a, a medical surgical bed or a medical surgical floor. It's typically multiple floors, right? Not just one floor, right? Typical, typically the ratio during the day is about four patients to every one nurse. Now at night they switch it. They tend to have more patients per nurse at night. In other words, less nurses at night because not as many tests and procedures or orders are going on, et cetera, et cetera. So oftentimes they double it. So there's eight patients to every one nurse at night. Then there's the step down, and the step down is actually a step up from the med surge level in terms of the patients tend to be sicker on a step down floor in a step down unit. There the nursing ratio is typically about three nurses to every one patient. So because the patients are sicker, the nurse takes care of three patients instead of four. And then at night, the ratio might be six to one or five to one, I've seen it vary, uh, or four to one even, I've seen it vary in a number of places. Okay, and then there's the intensive care unit, the ICU which has the lowest ratio of two patients for every one nurse. And typically they don't vary that at night because when these people are critically ill, like the amount of stuff that's going on to take care of them, it, I mean, it might be a little less at night, but you can oftentimes have you know, very sick patients that are crashing in the middle of the night as well. Now, all of these nursing ratios have a great de degree of flexibility in terms of or I should say flexibility, the great degree of fluctuation in terms of the patient demands. Meaning what you can have is what's referred to now as, a, as an RRT or a rapid response team. When I was back working on the floor, we kind of called them AFDs or acute floor decompensations where somebody could become very sick, sort of out of the blue. They could be, you know, kind of stable, and all of a sudden it requires a ton of nursing input and doctor input and all sorts of things like that. And so, shoot, if you're on a regular floor at 8 to 1, and you have one of your patients crashing, then there's like almost nothing you can do to help your other seven patients. So then the nurses try to cover for each other. And then if you have multiple patients that are crashing on the floor at the same time, then it's totally um, out of control. There's just no way there's enough nursing resources to take care of the patient needs on the floor. And that's what these nurses in Minnesota are saying. They're saying, look, there's, we're spread so thin that we can't provide adequate care to these patients, especially if they become acutely ill on the floor because you're giving us too many patients. Okay, now in regards to the pay, I'll leave a link in the show notes to an article where it says, look, the average pay for a nurse in Minnesota is about $81,000 per year. So. If you divide that by 22,000 hours in a year, they're making about $40 an hour. Now, if they're asking for a 30% raise, that means that they're asking to make about $104,000 per year. Now, is that reasonable? Is that unreasonable? Like, I'm not here to judge that, but we need to put it in context of something that has happened since the COVID pandemic. And that is, because of the nursing shortage, hospitals have had to hire a lot of traveling nurses to fill in for some of the nursing positions. So you'll have a floor, let's say with five nurses working, and there might be three nurses that are on staff at the hospital and two traveling nurses. So here's the problem. The traveling nurses make a lot more than the nurses on the floor, and they're like doing the same work. So a traveling nurse will make, again, I'll leave a link in the show notes to these resources, between $3,000 and $7,000 a week. 
and they're going to be working about 36 hours in that week. Typically, three 12-hour shifts. That's where the 36 hours comes from. Well, if you divide, let's take the middle of the 3,000 and the 7,000, which is $5,000 a week, and you divide by, that by 36 hours, that means that a traveling nurse is making $139 an hour versus the $40 an hour that the nurse that is employed by the hospital is making for doing the exact same job. So when the nurses in Minnesota are like, we want a pay raise because you're paying these traveling nurses three times the amount that you're paying us to do the same job. So instead of just paying all these traveling nurses, why don't you just pay your staff nurses more? Now, I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong, but what I am saying is these are the economics of nursing that are going on in America currently. Now, so fine. What is an important diet? So basically what we're talking about here is the labor market for nursing services. So now I have to go over some, uh, some sort of labor economic terms with you. I'm sorry, it's boring. Stick with me. Okay, so there was a very, um, there's a sort of well-known uh, report, and I'll leave, again, I'll leave a link in the show notes, that said, look, that 80% of hospital markets in, in America, in other words, geographic markets, whether it be New York or LA or even rural areas like in the middle of Missouri or what have you, right? That 80% of, 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 of markets in America for hospital services are highly concentrated. And highly concentrated is just the boring economics way of saying you don't have a lot of choices. It's more towards the spectrum of monopoly there's only one or two or maybe a handful of hospital systems versus having a lot of choices, okay? So, it, so in other words, highly concentrated means decreased choice. So now what that means is, is that here you have the hospital where there's not a lot of choices of hospitals and those hospitals take care of patients. Now, the hospitals are providing a service to the patient. The patients are the customers. So in that case, when there's not a lot of options, it's referred to as a monopoly, okay? but the hospital also has to buy things. It has to buy labor from nurses. So when there's not a lot of choices for in purchasers, so there's not a lot of purchasing options in ma the majority of markets in America, that's called a monopsony. It's kind of a weird, weird word. So there's a monopoly, which is not a lot of choices for customers, and then there's a monopsony, which is not a lot of choices for, in this case, labor. So if you're a nurse in a market, hospital marketplace in America, you don't have a lot of choices in terms of the hospital systems where you work. And so as a result of, those, of that monopsony, then just like a monopoly can take advantage of, of customers, monopsony, monopsonies can take advantage of labor. And so at the end of the day, if the hospital's like, well, we're not going to pay you as much and we're going to give you more patients. And then, of course, everybody has a choice to be like, well, fine. Well, I'm not going to work here anymore. I quit. Well, the point is, is that in that town, you don't have a lot of other options. Okay. So, and guess what? That, that, that sort of monopsony exists in a lot of other industries in America. So the auto industries, right? When, you know, the big three automakers, GM, Ford, and Chrysler the uh, United Auto Workers, right? So you don't, so there's a monopsony for auto worker labor. And so there's unionization for auto worker um, in, the, in the automobile industry. Okay, likewise, for airlines, there's not a lot of airline choices. You got American, you got United, you got Southwest, you got Delta. Maybe you got a couple other choices. I don't know, they come and go. Air Alaska, whatever it's called, right? So, okay, so there's a lot of unions for it pilots and flight attendants and the mechanics, baggage handlers, etc. Okay, likewise for education. Well, you got these school systems. Like, if you want to be a teacher in this area, I mean, yeah, you can work for a private school, but like the school system in that area, like they're like the monopsony for teachers in that area. So now, the point of this video is not to debate the pros and cons of unions or not. The point is, is that when you have highly concentrated industries that have monopsonies for labor input, that typically results in unionization. So to the extent that hospitals have consolidated and continue to consolidate, then they should expect greater nursing unionization. They should expect it. Now, I'm not saying it's a guarantee. I'm not saying it's morally right or wrong to do it. I'm just saying that's what's happened in other industries when you have monopsonies. That's probably what you're going to have here. That's just kind of how it works. Now, so fine. 
So the hospital systems cry poor and they're like, well, we don't have the money to hire more nurses. We don't have the money to pay them more wages. So of course they've got several options. Well, one option is obviously to go to their insurance carrier and negotiate higher reimbursements, which then goes to the employers and the insurance carriers are like, okay, well, we need to hire renewal on you, the employer. So you're going to get a 30, 40, 50% renewal. And they're going to be like, well, it's not our fault, the insurance company. It's the hospital's fault because they're asking for all this money. And the hospital's going to be like, well, it's not our fault. The nurses are asking for all this money. So everybody cries poor, right? What's new? My point is, is that when you have pushback, maybe the employers are like, we're not going to pay. We're not going to be fully insured. We're not going to take the increase. We're going to go self-funded. Forget it. Maybe the insurance company says, we're not going to increase the amount that we pay you for XYZ CPT code or DRG or what have you. The point is, where could the hospitals find the money if they needed to? Well, one might argue that they could find it in administrative bloat and they could find it in huge degrees of hospital construction. So. This is a whole other topic for another day, but very briefly, hospital administrators, the, 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 the number of hospital administrators has increased by 3,200% between 1975 and 2010, right? Not 3%, not 30%, not 320%, 3,200%. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are 500,000, five, half a million healthcare administrative jobs. And I'm not talking health insurance, I'm talking just on the provider side, just at, mostly at the major hospital systems, okay? On average, the salary is $100,000 a year. Again, I'll leave a link in the note to the Bureau of Labor Statistics on this. And then there's about 4.3 million nurses, which means that there's one hospital, there's one healthcare hospital administrator for every eight nurses. Okay, that seems like an awful lot of, and there, that just seems like a lot, okay? so. So one, administrative bloat. Two, construction. So the amount of hospital system construction has increased over the last 20 years from 25 billion to 50 billion. So the amount of hospital construction has doubled. And in fact, I'll leave a link in the show notes to a construction uh, trade magazine that says that, look, hospital construction here in 2022, even given inflation and even given the financial strains that uh, COVID has placed on hospitals, hospital construction is continuing to boom. So maybe if hospitals were forced to cut back on their construction and actually forced, now this, now listen, who does the, the job cutting in a hospital? The, health, the hospital administrators themselves. So hospital administrators are obviously going to be re not interested in cutting their own hospital administrator colleagues versus some nameless, faceless nurse or tech that they don't know. Right? So there's, to a certain extent, they're going to try to protect their own, but maybe we need to have cuts in hospital administration and hospital construction, and we take that money to pay for more patient-facing clinical resources like nurses, and maybe that's the right thing to do. Now, maybe we should just increase costs for employers. Who knows what's going to happen? But I wanted to share that with you today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.